Hey, welcome to Vive Church and our podcast. I know that each and every message you're going to find in this series, This Life I Now Live, is going to minister to you. I believe it's going to minister life to you as you receive it. So why don't you dig into the Word, prepare your hearts to receive revelation as God speaks to you today. God bless. So you guys ready for the Word? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 through 11. If you're not there yet, I can't help you. Right? Just go to your table of contents. Here we go. No shame in the table of contents. It's there for a reason. God knew. God knew we needed it. Anyways, let's go. First Peter chapter 5, 5 through 11. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you be sober-minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and after you have suffered a little while the god of all grace whom has called you to his eternal glory in christ will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you to him be dominion forever and ever amen could i get an amen Amen. and today obviously i want to talk to you along the subject of humility and um that you do not have to depend on self-promotion and i just have a thesis for this morning and it's this having a fear of the lord or reverence produces humility and god promotes and elevates the humble and i wanted to come around this subject with the message i'm entitling humble brag you guys ready let's pray father we thank you for your word and we thank you that it is inspired by the power of the holy spirit we thank you that it is god breathed and so god we just say that right now would you have your way i pray that this would not be something that just meets us intellectually but i pray that there would be heart transformation this morning and it's in your son's mighty name we pray all god's people said amen amen go ahead and take your seats say hello to your neighbors look at one of the neighbors and say sit down look at the other neighbor and say be humble if you know you know if you don't don't write me an email have you ever threatened to destroy someone's life Whoa, 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 I heard a lot of yeses. I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. I have. I have. And um, I, I feel like I need to give a little bit of context. You're like, you're a pastor. You can't do that. Uh, I can do whatever I want. I'm just kidding. No, I can't. Um, but this was when I was younger, when I was in college. I have three younger sisters. And one of them just got married. And so it just made me think of just all of the things that we've gone through. And there was this one memory that we had that just kind of stuck out. And the way that our house was set up back then was I had a room and her, we were sharing a wall. And she came home really late one night. And um, I don't know what it is about women, but you could feel and sense the emotion even though I don't see you. I don't know what it is. But she came into the house and she just boom, slammed the door. Slammed the door. She comes into it and I'm just like, what's her problem? What is her problem? It must be that time. It must be that time. I'm just going to leave her alone. I'm just going to let her be in her room. And... I'm just listening. I'm just minding my own business. I'm just minding my own business on my computer, probably playing games. And I just hear this in the other room. (laughs) Right? I'm just like, I'm just getting annoyed. It's not my problem. You deal with it yourself. And then it just starts progressively getting louder. Just like, you know what I mean? You've heard it. You've all heard it. And I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to put on my headphone. Just putting on my headphones. Like, uh, I don't hear anything. And it just gets to a point where I'm just like, what is happening? So, as the older brother, I come into the room, I, I open the door, I say, why are you crying? No finesse. Why are you crying? Tell me right now. Why are you crying? And she ignores me. She's crying. And you know it's bad when they do that mouthy dog. You know what I mean? That's what she was doing. She couldn't even say sentences. And so I'm yelling at her. I'm just like, why are you crying? I'm trying to enjoy my time by myself. Tell me why you're crying. And she goes, it's nothing. Everything about that statement knew that it was not nothing. And if women ever say nothing, it means it's everything. It means where do I even begin? And so 
I switch up my approach. I don't switch up what I'm saying because I'm not that fast, but I just say, hey, why are you crying, <laughs> right? Just bring down my voice. Just, why are you crying? And um, eventually she settles down and she goes, there's this girl at school that's been bullying me for a month. And she's been calling me names. And in the middle of the hallway, she'll push me every once in a while. And it's just been really tiring. And let me tell you right now, I, I haven't seen red before, but that day I saw red. And I said, heck no, absolutely not. And so now as an older brother, I have an obligation to destroy somebody's life. I have never felt so much permission in my entire life. And mind you, I'm in college. She's in high school. Without contest, this looks like a really bad situation. But I knew some seniors at that school because I'm an alumni. And so what I asked him, he was, one, he was in the EASB, and I was like, hey, there's this girl. I need you to find me her address. <laughs> and you bet, I found her address by the next day. And so what I did was I pulled three of my biggest friends. Because if you look at me, I'm small, right? So I was just like, you know what? <laughs> if I come by myself, she's going to be like, ha ha, yeah, whatever, right? right? So I'm going to be three of my biggest friends. We're all going to bring our own individual cars. We're going to park in front of her house, and we're going to wait for her to come home. And so that's what we did. That is exactly what we did. We drove up, we parked in front of her house, and we waited for her to come home. We knew when the school ended, we knew that she was walking home. So we wait, and we sat, and we were just looking out for a short little Asian girl. And eventually, she starts coming over. And I was like, there she is. <laughs> there she is. Oh, she's about to feel it today. And so me and all my friends get out of the car, and I can just imagine the fear in her eyes, right? She's like, is that for me, right? And we start walking towards her. I go, hey, 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 hey. She's just trying to ignore us because she's like, there's like four guys trying to, you know, like holler at me. I'm just like, hey. And we eventually get her, com get her uh, attention because we're like five feet away. And I just ask her, hey, do you know um, a girl named Charity, which is my sister's name? She goes, yeah. And I said, um, I heard you've been bullying her. And I just want to let you know that if I ever see her cry again, if I ever hear your name again, I will find you. I will come to your home. And let me just say, I used some colorful language, but I took away from Liam Neeson's line in the take. And I was like, I will find you and I will destroy you. She cried. She ran into the home, told the principal, all that stuff. Who cares? Now, I tell this story because on the surface, um, it looks like I stood up for injustice. It looks like I stood up for what was wrong. I, I took things into my own hands, and I made what was wrong right. But there wasn't anything humble about what I did. It was actually quite the opposite. I took things into my control. I didn't even trust, I didn't even ask God what he wanted to do, Right? Like, I was not Christian for 48 hours. I was just like, I don't care, you know? I'm going to start listening to Kendrick Lamar. Like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Hillsong, you're done. Planet Shakers, you're done. I like rap now. It was crazy. It was a crazy 48 hours. But I didn't even ask God how he wanted me to appropriate the situation. I didn't even ask God what he thought about it. Instead, I overestimated myself and did it anyways because I believe she deserved it. So the question is, what is humility? And um, yesterday night, I was watching some YouTube shorts because I actually wanted to know what the world, how the world defines humility. I literally just wrote, what is humility? Right? And I just looked for non-Christians. And the top three was Terry Crews. I don't know why he was up there, but he was up there. And his definition of humility is, when I'm strong and I carry groceries for the week. That is his definition of humility. I was like, okay, not a bad start. Kind of weird, but not a bad start. And then there was a monk that said that his definition of humility is the absence of joy. And I'm just like, I'm so glad I'm not part of that religion, right? It's just like, I'm so glad. Lord, thank you. The gratefulness just showered all over me. And then um, there was this other video. You know those people that like go up to you and just like stick a microphone in your face and start interviewing you? It was one of those. And they ask her, like, what is humility to you? And she goes, um, I think it's when you 
look at your inside and you just look at the true you and just live out the true you. And I'm just like, Ugh. Ugh. people are crazy. You need to define stuff these days because definitions be switching. So I'm going to tell you exactly what humility is. Humility is not any of those things. But I would describe humility as a fair estimation of oneself. Or in the simplest terms, through a biblical worldview, what it means is humility is to think of yourself the way that God thinks about you. And anything else outside of that is inappropriate, is wrong, is a perversion. And so we think what God thinks about us. It's not thinking lower of yourself, but that you actually recognize the gifts that God has given you. And you say, God, you've given me these gifts. And I'm going to use it to build your kingdom. I'm going to use it for you. And so when we read 1 Peter, Peter is trying to explain the cheat code to new believers. He's trying to explain the cheat code to establish people in their faith, to strengthen them, to restore them, to give them a steadfastness in Jesus. And he's writing this letter because there are Christians who are fading away from the faith. There are Christians who decided to follow Jesus receive the gospel, but suffering is hitting, life is getting hard, and they're beginning to teeter on the edge whether they should go back to Judaism. Because what you have to understand is back in those days, when you forsook or forsake, forsook, I don't know, right? Have grace on me, right? If you forsook, suck, I'm just going to go with it. Your old religion, what actually happened was you have severed every single non-Christian relationship in your life. So that means your parents, your friends, your neighbors, and it's not even just on a relational level, but it's also on a financial and business level. That means the people, the businesses that you've been building and the partners or the vendors that you've been working with these entire years are no longer doing business with you. So it completely destabilized anyone that said, I am a Christian. It's not like today where you just throw around the word, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ. It had different meaning back then. It was a derogatory term. It usually meant that you were a troublemaker, that you were a criminal. And having the title of Christian usually meant that there was a chance that you were going to die. And so there's these believers that are facing suffering, and they're on the edge of like, should I just go back? Should I just go back to what I know? And Peter is writing a letter saying, stay true to the gospel. Because God is supreme, he's over your life, and there's just a single little key that I want to give you to unlock things in your life. And some of the believers are beginning to think, this is just not what I expected. This is not what I expected when I first heard the gospel. And maybe there are some of you in this room that are feeling a similar way, where it's not what you expected. I thought, God, after I received you, everything would just go away. I thought I'd look at my financial debt thing and all of a sudden Biden would just be like, delete. No, it's still there, God. God, why is it that after I started following you, things just got really hard? And I'm believing by the end of today, we will have the tools to establish in reverence for Jesus. Amen. So we're going to go back to our series passage in verse five. Verse five, we're just going to go through it verse by verse. And it says this. Verse 5, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. We're going to stop right there. The first practical tool Peter gives the people is this, be subject to the elders. When Peter says elders, he's actually referring to appointed leadership within the church. So there is an order of authority. There's God, and then there is people that God has appointed over the church. And so thank God we don't have to do things alone. Thank God that there's church and there's people to follow. Like Pastor Adam and Kira. If I did not follow them, I don't know what I'd be doing. Probably still yelling at my sister right now. Why are you crying? Who knows? But I think some of us get triggered when we hear the word authority. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're skeptical of traditional authority because we've been under either poor leadership that have made mistakes, or maybe leadership that have taken advantage of their leadership position. And um, I feel that skepticism too sometimes. 
When I first came to Vive seven, eight years ago, um, I was a skeptic. And when I mean I was skeptical, I was like, these guys are too nice. These guys are so nice, I don't think they're Christian. They remember my name. And not just one person, multiple people remember my name. There's a text thread going around saying, Benjamin's here. I don't know what it is. And you want to take me to lunch? And you're going to pay? Huh. <laughs> What is this? And you're going to invite me to your home group? You're going to buy dinner for me and I don't have to pay? What's the deal? And so because I was skeptical, because I did not trust in authority, I stopped tithing. What I actually did was I would get 10% of my income. I was on the Dave Ramsey plan back then, so I had multiple envelopes, right? (laughs) I had an envelope of my tithe and every single two weeks that I would get paid, I would put 10% into that envelope. And it got to six months where I was not tithing, and my envelope was about this fat, about this fat. And the thought that I was having was, God, I just don't trust this church. God, I I just don't trust the leadership. I was like the farmer with the talents that instead of sowing it, what I did was I'm just going to put it into the dirt, and I'm just going to wait for kingdom to come. And it took me some time to realize that the root wasn't that I didn't trust the church or leadership, but at the root is, God, I didn't trust you. God, I actually don't trust you with my finances. But God, I want to make sure that the finances are used properly. God, I want to make sure that my $20 that I'm giving right now is going to missions. I don't want it to buy snacks for the youth. God, I don't care about the youth. I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to India. The youth are fine. Thank you for the snacks. But a sign that we're not walking in humility is when we begin to take control of our own situations. And we've all been there, right? None of us are exempt, myself included. Because sometimes things come up. Usually an emergency, things that are out of our control, things that we haven't planned. How many planners are in here? Yeah, this this message is for you, okay? And when we get to that place, we get reactionary. And sometimes we just take control. Anyone ever been cut off on the freeway before? Anyone ever been cut off on your way to church? (laughs) And there's just something that just takes over. It's a reaction. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a spirit. And then a finger just begins to rise. (laughs) I don't know what it is. Just me? Just me? Old me. Old me. Not, Not recent me. Old me. Clarification. Or maybe you've been laid off from work and you've seen God provide for you over and over again in the past, but in a moment of panic, you just begin to go into poverty mode. You're just like, God, I I don't know if you're going to pull through again. So I'm just going to look for jobs that I'm overqualified for or just begin to start scrambling and start panicking. Or maybe you're genuinely going through a difficult time in your life where it's things that are completely out of your control. And the way that we take control is by doing things that are within our control, whether it be toxic relationships, whether it be drug abuse, whether it be pornography, and we fill that gap that God is meant to fill. And we take control because we don't trust the authority we're under, whether it be man or God. And some of us have taken it so far to remove all authority, And by default, what that does is it actually puts the pressure and responsibility on you. So you'll find Christians today on a spiritual journey alone. They're usually deconstructing their faith. They're usually in their mom's basement, watching sermons, nitpicking, writing comments. I love those hateful comments. I just want to respond to all of one of them. Anyways, it's usually like that. And you see them because they don't have a trust for any authority. So now they are the only authority that they trust. Now, what they're saying is, now I'm the only one who can find and interpret the truth. And we have a generation who made themselves a sole interpreter of their truth. The whole deconstruction movement is autonomy. It's a crisis of authority. And not only do I need to interpret the truth, but I'm also my own judge. I'm also my own protector. And I have to decide what is right and wrong. This is demonic. 
And it's demonic because it puts yourself in the place that Jesus is meant to be. As your high priest, as your judge, as your comforter, as your teacher, as your savior, as your Lord. And so no wonder why you're anxious. Because you're the one in control. Now this is exactly what the enemy wants to do. Look inward. The enemy wants you to believe the answers you find within yourself. The more you think about yourself, the more that you find your true self, like that Instagram girl said. And I believe the enemy understands that there are really only two worldviews. One worldview is this. God exists, and because God exists, God makes the rules. And the second worldview is this. God doesn't exist, or God is dead, and so I am God. And you'll find majority of major ideas falling within those two categories. But we know that the truth is not found in you. It's found in Jesus. It's outside of us. It's external, but it can be experienced internally. And so an accurate and true estimation of yourself can only be found in Jesus. So in order that we do not fall into this lie, Peter gives us structure to humility to be subject to the elders. Do not isolate yourself, but be humble. Humble yourself to the body of Christ. You guys still with me? All right, we're moving on. Verse five. The second thing Peter tells the church is this. Clothe yourselves. I am so grateful you guys are all wearing clothes today. Amen. I'm not going to go. Anyways, I'm just grateful. And it says this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, when I first read this verse, and it had the language of clothe yourself, my mind went to Harry Potter, which is wizards. I know, I'm a work in progress. But it went to Harry Potter, and it made me think of when Harry Potter puts on that invisibility cloak. It's kind of like the thinnest, sheerest thing that they hold on. Any wind blowing could just blow it away or someone could just walk it off. And so you have to walk around with the invisibility cloak like that. So that's what I thought being clothed in humility looked like. But actually, the literal interpretation of being clothed or clothing yourself is to fasten with a knot or to bind to yourself. It's not something that you just put over your shoulders. It's not something that just rests on your body, but it's something that you bind to yourself. And we see similar language used when Jesus humbles himself and washes the feet of his disciples. In John chapter 13, verse 4 to 5, it says this, He laid aside his outer garment and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, If anyone was entitled to anything, it's Jesus. If anyone deserves anything, it's Jesus. Jesus should not be the one washing the disciples' feet, but he's setting a model for us of what it looks like to be humble, what it looks like to be the humble king, to set our preferences aside, our reputation aside for the benefit of others, to prefer others and to serve others before ourselves. He takes off his outer garment and he begins to fasten on with a knot, a tool of service, a towel. And I'm wondering if there's some of you in here where you guys are wearing outer garments that need to be laid down, that need to be set aside so that you can bind yourself to humility. Because as Pastor Adam mentioned last week, there are really only two options. You can either build his kingdom or you can build your empire. It's one or the other. And we can either be in opposition with God who opposes the proud or we can be in opposition with the devil who opposes the humble. Choose. It's one or the other. Both is in opposition, opposition, but you get to choose. And I want to choose to close close myself in humility because I'm so aware of my own sinful nature. Just because I'm a pastor does not mean I do not have the potential to sin. I have the potential to sin greatly. And now, if you're thinking in this moment right now, I'm not that prideful. 
I'm not that controlling. This message is literally for you. So if you haven't started taking notes, now's the time. And God is gracious. So every day, I need God. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in every single area of my life. Not just as a husband, not just as a parent, not just in how I manage my finances, not just in how I measure my time. In every aspect of my life, I need Jesus. So I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my preferences. I trust you as my judge. I trust you, Jesus. Because when we humble ourselves, God begins to brag about you. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Can I get an amen? The third practical tool Peter gives us is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now this phrase mighty hand is kind of weird because if you're visual like me you just see like a hand just like over places right? It's not like that. But this language is familiar. It's a familiar phrase usually connected to the deliverance of the people in Egypt. And if you remember anything about the story of the people in Egypt, they were enslaved for generations. They had no practical means of freedom. There was no way they were going to be free. But God sends a prophet. God sends a prophet and says, Moses, I need you to go and tell Pharaoh, as you guys already know, in the in the movie, let my people go. And so Peter is encouraging the readers to humble yourselves under this mighty hand of God, the mighty hand of God that brought the plagues onto the land of Egypt, the mighty hand of God that removed people from Pharaoh's grip, the mighty hand that split the Red Sea, the mighty hand that provided water and manna in the desert. The same mighty hand of God can set you free today. All it requires is for us to humbly come before Jesus. You do not have to fend for yourself. That's a lie from the enemy. You do not have to self-promote. Because when we seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will be given onto us. And if you don't believe it, I'll give you more scripture. Proverbs 3.34 says this, Towards the scorner, he is scornful. But to the humble, he gives favor. There is favor for those that are humble. It's a promise. You humble, you're going to get favor. Matthew 23, 12 says this. This is Jesus speaking on the principle of humility. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Not an if or when or maybe will be exalted. Will be exalted. It's a promise. Humility gives us access to God exaltation. And finally, verse 7. Verse 7 says this, Casting all your anxieties onto him because he cares for you. The fourth and practical tool Peter gives us is the best. Cast your anxieties onto Jesus. Now, the word cast is a very verbal verb. And If you guys ever been fishing, I've never been fishing, but I'm assuming if you have a net, you're not going to cast it like this. Uh, You're not. If you want to catch fish, I I just see the YouTube videos. I don't know. They do like the, they do this thing and then they go, yucka. And then it goes all the way out there. You cast it. It's a hurl. And what Jesus is saying is all your anxieties, everything that you go through, everything that's on your mind, I don't want you to just lay it at my feet. I want you to hurl it at me. I want you to give it to me. Cast it onto me because he cares for you. Everything you're worried about, everything that you feel like is out of your control, the breakthrough you've been praying for years, cast it onto him. The cancer that's invading your body, cast it onto Jesus. The visa lottery situation that's out of your control, cast it onto him. Your marital status, cast it onto him. Because he cares for you. Matthew 6, 25, 34 says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body. What you'll put on, it is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds 
them? Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble anxiety comes from control and humility is when we give God the control so cast your cares onto him because he cares for you there's a lot more I want to say but I'm just going to end with this just recapping humble yourselves before people get added to the church Clothe yourself in humility daily. Humble yourself before God and cast all your anxieties onto Him. And we'll end with this promise, 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast to be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, just because it ends with the amen doesn't mean it's a prayer. This is a promise of God. He said that He will restore you. The imagery that's described in this word restore is kind of described when ships are being repaired after battle or a storm. That God will restore you back to perfection. He will make you strong. Your position will be fixed. It's unchangeable. It's unshakable. There will be a strength to the things that you do. He will make you firm in your purpose. There will be no wavering. There will be no fogginess of the mind. And He will make you steadfast. You will be given a foundation. And that foundation is Jesus.